Now imagine if someone went to a Halloween party dressed up as Anne Frank. Hi everyone, welcome to The Humane Factor. I'm Namrita, a human rights lawyer and activist. Now I started this channel so that we can talk about socially relevant issues. The support I have received is overwhelming. Thank you all so much for supporting this channel. It means a lot to me. If you haven't subscribed already, please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to turn on notifications so you don't miss my videos. Now in the past decade, several companies have been called out for cultural appropriation for selling expensive versions of certain products that they've adopted from different cultures. So what is cultural appropriation? Now cultural appropriation is the act of taking or using things from a culture that is not your own, especially without showing that you understand or respect this culture. But is cultural appropriation always problematic? What's the harm in enjoying aspects of different cultures? I eat pizza and sushi often. Is that cultural appropriation? Now cultural appropriation becomes controversial when members of a dominant culture appropriate elements from disadvantaged or minority cultures, ultimately erasing their origins and meaning. Now this is because a certain power dynamic is at play here. Now cultural appropriation is not the same as cultural exchange when people mutually exchange aspects of their culture with each other. That's because cultural exchange lacks that systemic power dynamic. Cultural appropriation is also not the same as cultural assimilation when marginalized people adopt elements of the dominant culture in order to survive conditions that make life more of a struggle if they don't. Now that's because marginalized groups don't have the power to decide if they prefer to stick with their customs or adopt the dominant culture's traditions to make their lives less difficult. So eating pizza or sushi is not cultural appropriation because there's no power dynamic and the origins of both these dishes haven't been erased, profited from or misrepresented. For instance, if a white woman who is interested in Native American culture starts a business based on what she's learned, that might seem innocent, right? But the problem is that in order to sell her products, she has to participate in a certain system in which white women are given more opportunities than Native American women. So while she profits, the Native American women she adopted her products from don't get anything. Look, I win. Where's my prize? Where's my prize? Now another huge problem with cultural appropriation is that it oftentimes misrepresents the truth about marginalized cultures. For instance, if you dress up your child as Pocahontas for a Halloween party, it's actually pretty disturbing if you think about the real story of Pocahontas. Now the real Pocahontas, whose actual name was Matoka, was abducted as a teenager forced to marry an Englishman and used as propaganda for racist practices before she died at the age of 21. And did you know that Pocahontas was actually a derogatory nickname meaning spoiled child or naughty one? Now imagine if someone went to a Halloween party dressed up as Anne Frank. That is totally inappropriate. Exactly. We don't hear the real stories and most of us don't live with a direct connection to people's sufferings. So appropriating someone's culture in a manner that misrepresents the truth or trivializes their sufferings is quite problematic. 
Now you guys can probably make out that I grew up in an Indian household from the way I look and my accent, which I'm incredibly proud of. Dude, my accent is brilliant. Now I've lived in Europe for several years now, but my Indian roots continue to stick with me. Today I'll talk about four aspects of Indian culture that has been appropriated. The first one is yoga. I'm sure you saw this one coming. I know that lots of people do yoga and just because yoga has been culturally appropriated, it doesn't mean you can't practice it or it's offensive to practice it. Now the issue with yoga is how it's commonly commercialized in Western contexts. Now yoga practices are based on traditions that go back thousands of years in South Asia. But this context and much of the essence of yoga's meaning has been stripped away. With yoga being commercialized so much, many people think of it as a type of exercise and nothing more. Now, who is ready for their yoga? Now, it's important to know that with yoga, the physical component is just a small fraction of the practice. It's also a spiritual path. The story of how it got turned into the form of exercise you know today isn't a pretty one. When the British colonized India, lots of people were persecuted for not converting to Christianity. Consequently, people who promoted yogic teachings, which was deep-rooted in spirituality, were also persecuted. This catalyzed a coercion towards Western-style athletics and aesthetics. So yoga was forcibly transformed into just that. Now many lineages maintained the deep spiritual practices, but had to keep these teachings private for fear of violent repercussions. Now throughout the history of colonization, demonizing the spiritual practices of indigenous people and people of color is part of how colonizers have justified violence against them. So it's important that we don't redefine yoga as a solely physical practice. Doing so legitimizes what Western people like about yoga and invalidates its original meaning. Now many of the yogic teachings that were brought to the West were done so with this continual colonial coercion with a need to appease and appeal to the Western mind by either connecting yoga with Christianity or redefining it as a solely physical activity. Today you have hot yoga, beer yoga, wine yoga, goat yoga and whatnot. These types of practices erase the true meaning and origin of yoga. Moving on, the second one that's been culturally appropriated is turmeric. Now, if you're not South Asian, you probably identify turmeric as the powder that gives what you call curry its yellow color. Or you've seen turmeric in those fancy golden milk lattes in coffee shops. But turmeric, which is also known as haldi, has its roots in Indian Ayurvedic medicine. It's like the Indian gold. Yeah, it's gold. Turmeric is anti-inflammatory and has tons of medicinal and healing properties. Now, in the early 1990s, an American university was awarded a patent for turmeric, which India successfully challenged. The patent was ultimately revoked and the traditional knowledge that belonged to India stayed there, thankfully. But this case brought to light the dangers of biopiracy, especially with respect to indigenous knowledge. But this hasn't stopped companies from profiting from this indigenous knowledge. That golden milk latte that many coffee shops sell, it's actually haldi dood which we drink in India and parts of Southeast Asia. It's basically warm milk with turmeric and spices like cinnamon, cardamom and black pepper. When I was a kid and I caught a cold or a cough, my mom used to make haldi dood. 
It's quite amusing to see this being repackaged into a fancy drink and then being sold in cafes, restaurants and even grocery stores across the world for a steep price. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with enjoying something delicious from another culture. But what's problematic is that turmeric's true origins have been erased and the dominant group, which is Western companies, have profited from and been given credit for aspects of a culture that they have taken from a developing country like India, thereby reinforcing the power imbalance between the two groups. Moving on, the third one on my list is the famous fast fashion brand Zara. Now a couple of years ago, Zara came out with what they called a stylish check skirt. The brand described it as a flowing skirt with draped detail in the front. But as people were quick to point out, this skirt is actually nothing but a lungi. Well, the way I see it, there are three possibilities. One, you stole it. Two, you stole it. Or three, you stole it! A lungi is a wide strip of cloth traditionally worn by men in parts of South and Southeast Asia. The cloth is wrapped around the hip and tied together in the front to form a drape. Now, not only did Zara attempt to sell a design very similar in both color and pattern to the traditional lungi, but they also tried charging about 30 times the cost. While the Zara skirt costs almost $90, you can get a lungi in India for around $3. Now, Zara received a lot of backlash for this. The reaction was a mixture of laughter and fury, with people putting up pictures of Zara's so-called skirt side by side with middle-aged Indian men wearing lungis. Also, many South Asians were quite amused at this overpriced garment being marketed as women's fashion because in India and many South Asian countries, we associate lungis with our fathers, uncles and grandfathers. Well, now that I know lungis are in vogue, if I want to wear one, I'll definitely hit my dad's wardrobe. He has several lungis in that similar horrendous print. The fourth item to be culturally appropriated is chai or tea. Now, I'm not talking about tea in general here. I'm talking specifically about chai. Now, to most South Asians, chai is an integral part of our culture. If you're happy, drink chai. If you're sad, chai cheers you up. Celebrating? With chai, of course. Our guests coming over to your house. Then you've got to start making chai. We Desis prepare a wide variety of chai. It's a simple yet satisfying blend for us. One that connects us to our culture. Yet, Western companies have culturally appropriated chai and transformed it into sugary iced lattes. Now this appropriation of chai erases the violent history behind it that many Indians endured under the British rule when people were forced into labor to cultivate tea, which the British took. Western companies now market this drink as an exotic beverage. Well, this tea is nothing more than hot leaf juice. The Starbucks iced chai tea latte has no resemblance to an authentic cup of South Asian chai. And the name itself is cringeworthy. The term chai tea is redundant. Chai literally means tea. So saying chai tea is like saying tea tea. To any South Asian, this name sounds just as absurd as the drink itself. Now, as I said before, enjoying aspects of different cultures is not the issue here. Just as we enjoy sushi, Chinese food or pizza or listen to Bollywood music. What's important to remember is that cultural appropriation becomes problematic when there's a power dynamic at play. 
when a dominant culture takes aspects of marginalized cultures, erases its origin and meaning, and then either profits from it without giving credit where it's due, or misrepresents it, or both. So share this video with anyone who needs to see it. Maybe people who do yoga or drink golden milk or chai tea lattes or anyone who's bought that overpriced lungi from Zara. And please, please hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notified when I post videos every Wednesday and Saturday. See you soon.